Seek the Lord in prayer. I'll stand. Okay, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, first of all, for waking us up all from our beds for this chance of life. Thank you for this gift of life, Lord, and for, uh, for guiding us all here safely. And for those who are still coming, we will continue to guide them safely. And Heavenly Father, as we have this program, will you be with us to enlighten our minds so we can understand fully what you uh, have brought for us this morning. And Heavenly Father, I continue to pray for everyone here. Bless each one who is in this hall and continue to be with us throughout the day. Throughout the week, please for his father's sins. Help done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to our very special um, seminar this morning. We would like to welcome all the music majors. Music majors, please raise your hands. How many are you here now? You're supposed to be 50. <laughs> How some of them are in UP for a short seminar also there, like 10, 15 people. And I'd like to welcome our music ministry classes. Raise your hands. Music ministry classes, are you here? Yeah. Thank you very much. We'd like to welcome our speaker. And of course, we'd like to welcome a very special guest this morning. We have uh, Mr. Ray Puen. Sir, can you please stand? Thank you very much for coming. Mr. Ray Puen is uh, uh, one of the pioneers of the AP ambassadors, 1957. During that time, he was uh, uh, very active uh, in, in uh, music ministry. And now he is with the church planting uh, program. And he's here for the Bible camp. So thank you, sir, for coming. And he will be with the AUP ambassadors today also in the rehearsal. I'd like to introduce to you our, uh, our uh, guest speaker this morning, just for you to know her more. Um, she was uh, here in AUP for her elementary grades in 1994. And then 2001 to 2006, he took the piano performance here at AUP Music Department. So he's our, one of our uh, graduates. And uh, the following year, he was our teacher, and he taught music theory, and he taught piano. And uh, after that, he went to the US and studied masters of music in music education, specialization in organ. Uh, while in the US, he was a student librarian at James Dwight Library, and he was, she was also, sorry, an organist in Riverview Park Christian Church. And in 2010, she was with the Wildwood College of Health Evangelism. And 2011, uh, she was with the Lay Institute of Global Health Evangelism in Nueva uh, Era. And 2012, she joined the Central Philippines Adventist College, SIPA. And she was uh, a music teacher there. And at present, she's a full-time missionary volunteer of PAMAS. The PAMAS is Philippine Adventist Medical Aviation Services. What a ministry, right? So maybe you want uh, to join you're looking for some volunteers, ma'am, right? Yeah, join the aviation service. Maganda yun, ano? Gusto maging pilot din in the future. Okay, thank you very much. So, we would like to give her the time. And uh, if you need the restroom, just get out and out of the building. And there's, towards the other building, we have uh, restrooms there. Let's give, a, let's give a round of applause to our speaker, Mrs. Irene Gavas-Bennett. Well, good morning, and it's an opportunity to be back 
it's in my alma mater. <laughs> you know, it's, I heard that you're celebrating the 100 years. So it's yeah. nice. Yeah, next year. So I mean, I'm, I'm three months, five months early, but it's nice to be back. Anyways, I was um, really excited to, I'm really excited to share this topic with you this morning because ever since I, I did my thesis in Andrews seven years ago, I have never really shared it in this kind of format. So you are the first audience that will be hearing it this morning. And it's, we changed the title, Rekindling the Vision Early Advent Hymns Revisited. This is just a, a portion of the actual paper that I wrote because if, if I'm going to share everything, we're gonna go for a whole day maybe. So what were the things that really led me to write about this particular topic? As uh, what Sir Oblimar said this, um, to introduce me, I was working at the James White Library and that really was one of those things that, that, that helped me to be interested in our history as Seventh-day Adventists. I didn't care before, but seeing the, the, the wealth of materials in that library, seeing the original documents of the pioneers gave, this, um, gave me this feeling of, wow, I mean, this, this were our pioneers. This is the people that founded the Seventh-day Adventist faith, and that really, um, pushed me to to know more about the music that our, our pioneers wrote. One of one of the things that also inspired me was that in Andrews University they always have this annual heritage weekend, wherein every year we would go to Battle Creek and we would relive the the experiences of the pioneers. We would go and have a tour in the houses of J. N. Loughborough or Ellen White. Um, and of course, um, Dr. Kellogg's clinic and to see his inventions and how he helped people during that time um, also helped me to, you know, like gather my thoughts with, with regards to this particular topic. Um, I remember, um, if you, who are music majors here? Can you please raise your hands, okay? Are, have you taken your romantic literature, romantic uh, history of, Music, not yet. Okay, anyways, in, in the Romantic period, a lot of the composers would gather together in, in someone's house. It's a practice, and they would, they would talk about the, the topics of the day. And by talking about those topics that were happening in the environment or, you know, political, political issues of the day, uh, many of the compositions would be influenced by that. And somehow I, I kind of, I was kind of influenced that way, not by composition, but by writing this, because a lot of my friends, my circle of friends, were either taking their master's or their PhD in church history. So a lot of the things we talk about were always about the history of the Seventh-day Adventist church. So that also helped me. And then, uh, the, the, the thing that really pushed the envelope for me to really say, okay, I think this is what I need to write about, is I became a music coordinator for this group um, of students, we call it Revive, and we had this month-long early, um, early Advent Vespers. So we would, what we would do every Friday is to relive what the, the pioneers were doing, we would research, and then we would try, and I, since I'm the musician, I would be looking at the, the music and say, okay, this is what they wrote about, this is what they sang, and then after the Vespers, we'd ha we would have food that the pioneers, you know, would cook. During, so it's really um, very interesting. So as a result, the paper, the paper that I wrote was entitled Seventh-day Adventist Doctrines in Seventh-day Adventist Hymnody, from its beginnings to today. So what I did was to really look at the doctrines, how doctrines were um, not really inserted, but used and promulgated by the pioneers in their hymns, and how does it compare with the hymns that we have today? So also this year, because of my love for the hymns and the older hymns, 
I compiled what uh, we call line upon line prophetic hymns. I, I looked at all the hymns that had a prophetic um, oomph to it, compiled it, and I'm sharing it um, with people. So that is a hymnal that I compiled this year. So basically, hymns is our topic for this morning. Hymns in general, first, is what a lot of people called poor man's poetry and the ordinary person's theology. Why? Because it's very easily accessible and it's, you know, any, peop any person can relate to the hymn or the poetry that is in the hymn. Uh, the hymn is actually a popular, very popular kind of verse and it started even way, way back. And the word hymn is actually in the Bible. In our Bibles, and if you have it, or you can look at the screen, in Ephesians 5.19, it says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So here, Paul is exhorting the, the church to encourage each other, speak to each other in psalms or in songs, in hymns and spiritual songs. And that is one way that they can make melody in their hearts to the Lord. Another text is in Colossians 3, 16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Basically, it's the same concept wherein hymns are used to encourage one another, admonish one another, so to speak. So hymns are ex existing even during the Bible times, the ancient times. And um, it's very interesting that also in, if you, in the Greek period or ancient medieval period, hymns were really used by the Greeks, okay? It's, it's always a part of their worship. Now, and then we see hymns in history again when Martin Luther came into the picture. Okay, so after, you know, during the Renaissance period, for those who are not music majors, we divide history um, according, in, in music terms, we divide history by calling it names like such as Renaissance period, Baroque period, Classical period, uh, Romantic period. Um, then this name sort of uh, describes what is happening in a society or those are terminologies that aptly describes the issues of the day. So during the Renaissance period, this is the time when the Catholic Church is at, it, is at its peak, okay? And um, most of the, the, the musical life was really coming from, from the church, the, the Catholic church. And so when, when we say chants, okay, these are um, the kinds of songs that stemmed out of the Catholic church. So when the chants are sung, it's not sung by the congregation, okay? Be why? Because for one thing, chants are very some are, when we call it melismatic or heavily melismatic, a lot of notes. And so when you have congregation singing so many notes, it, it can really sound awful, especially because the church is big. You know, it's, it has this dome, and of course, that's also part of the architecture. They wanted the church to be like that. Uh, it's, I mean, if you've been in a church like that, okay, the echo, the bouncing, the bounce of the, the music will not sound nice if you have a lot of people singing a lot of notes that go up and down. So, uh, chants were mainly sung by a select group of people, okay? So, a lot of the really, really good musicians would be hired by the church or really good singers, they would be hired by the church and um, they will work for the church as singers or, or as composers. And that's how a lot of those really good musicians make a living during that day uh, for the church, okay? So 
after a while, you have the reformation happening and Martin Luther comes into the picture. And one of the things that he changed and that was a part of the reformation is to, to have, to make the congregation sing. He said, you know what, worship service should be, you know, uh, the, the church, the, the congregation should be able to praise the Lord as well with their own mouths. Because what's happening in the church was, okay, they sat there and there's a group of singers in front and then the part of the congregation is just to say, Amen, and that's it. So he said, no, we, I, we need to have the congregation participate in the worship service as well by singing. So he used um, the hymns as well to, to make the people sing and as well as to learn the doctrines of uh, righteousness by faith which Martin Luther introduced at that time. Well, not really introduced, but you know, a lot of the reformers have been writing about it, but Martin Luther was like the pinnacle of the Reformation era. So aside from the hymns being a popular kind of verse, hymns is also a main mode of vocal participation in the worship service, right? So even in today's worship, if you notice, when do you open your mouth, aside from when you talk to your seatmates, okay? When you say amen, right, to the sermon, but other than that, you open your mouth when you have to sing, right? The other people who are in doing it, um, something in front, they're the ones who speak a lot or, or use their mouth a lot. So music is really very important in the worship service because it helps the worshiper have this conscious response. That's why, uh, just a side note, for those who are preparing songs for the worship service, you have a very, very important role because the music that you need to choose, okay, the, the songs, the opening song, the closing song, it will play a very important role. It should connect to the message because if not, as a worshiper, it does not, the message did not really connect. So it has to be, uh, it has to be smooth or it has to flow. So, main mode of vocal participation. What else is the function of the hymn in worship? So, it is also an expression of what common churchgoers believe to be reliable and true, which is really important because if we don't believe what is written on the hymns, then what are the, what's the reason for us to sing it, right? And of course, one of the main um, things that I want to push today is that me, uh, hymns is a means to present and teach Christian doctrine. And I, actually, Martin Luther also used this to his advantage. What he did is he was thinking, okay, how, how can I best teach the people about righteousness by faith the fastest way possible? And what he did is, because he's also a composer as well as a theologian, he used both of those skills, composed music, well, composed some songs as well as and as well as put the lyrics and made the people sing it. If if he's not um, in charge of the congregation, he has a select group of people that would sing in the markets, and this is how the message spread really fast. Okay, but you know, of course, some people say, oh, you know, Martin Luther used songs that. Uh, were the secular tunes of the day, but that's another topic. But, um, okay, so those are really the, the functions of the hymns in general. We in the Adventist church also used uh, the hymns particularly to promote our doctrines, okay? Those are, the hymns became the vehicle for the Seventh-day Adventist church to promote its doctrines. And if we are going to, I forgot my slides. <laughs> so anyways, that's, that's that. let me just take this out. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's see. So that's just an old picture from the Catholic Church. That's, that's how they would sing. Uh, that's how the hymns look like, the chants look like uh, during the Renaissance period. And of course, you have Martin Luther who promoted hymns during the Reformation era, 
And then in the Adventist church, you have Joshua V. Hines. Anyone who is familiar, this guy, Joshua V. Hines. Okay, so Joshua Hines was actually known even before, even before he became a Millerite. He was known as an ardent crusader against slavery, liquor, and war. And his main purpose in life is to make the world a better place to live in. Okay, That's, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people want the world to be a better place to live in. And Joshua V. Himes made sure that his, his life's work would, would um, include that particular philosophy. So one day, he heard Miller speak about the anti-messages. And uh, when he heard him, he was, he was so touched, he was so moved and compelled. And so he said, he asked Miller, Miller, William Miller, do you really believe the messages that you're sharing? And Miller said, I will not be sharing these things if I don't really believe them. So, Haim said, well, if you really believe it, how come you're just sharing it in the small churches? Because at that time, William Miller, you know, you know William Miller. You're familiar with William Miller, right? So he's a farmer turned preacher, and he would only go to churches where he was invited. And so he was invited in the smaller churches in the countryside, and that's where he would go. So Haim said, why don't you go to the major cities? Go to, the, go to Rochester, to, um, to a lot of Boston, okay? Those are the major cities at that time in the uh, northern part of the United States. And William Miller said, well, I'm not getting any invitations. Why would I go? So Haim said, okay, I'm going to help you. And this man, when he promised he would help Miller, it's not like, hey, I'm just, I'm going to help you. I'm going to get you an appointment and then you, you know, you speak. No, he gave everything. His, he, his money, he, put, he poured it into William Miller's ministry. And as a result, he was in every major church and he was able to speak to thousands of people. So Miller, um, Himes actually decided to lay everything on the altar of God, and he became Miller's manager, advertising agent, consecrated promotion specialist, you know. So one of the things that he did for, the, for William Miller is to write publications. So have you heard of Science of the Times? The, we, we, we used to have those magazines before, okay? So it was started by Joshua V. Himes, and of course, Anyone who can help me with the technical issues, please do. <laughs> Thank you. So Joshua V. Himes wrote publication upon publication and publication. And so because Miller was only one person and he cannot go to all parts of the country uh, to, to share his messages. And so the publications help. There's no Facebook, there's no Instagram, there's no Twitter to, to make things, you know, go the message faster. So, Joshua V. Himes, aside from writing these publications, also believed that music can help in, in furthering the gospel, okay? So, what he did is he also compiled a lot of hymns. So, a lot, um, during this time, the people that were listening to M Miller's messages were people that are coming from different churches, okay? So, Baptists, Methodists, uh, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, they would, they were all, um, they would all listen to M Miller speak. Miller was not just invited in one particular church, okay? So at the time, um, if you're a preacher and you're a Protestant, then you can, you're, you know, you can go to any of these churches. So many, many of them were hearing these messages for the first time. And so the songs that were being sung during this time were also songs from other denominations. And so Haim said, you know what? Since we, are, we have a certain message that we preach, why don't we have a song or a hymnal that would really encompass these messages that William Miller is preaching? And so he decided to, 
he decided to compile a lot of this hymnal. So we're going to look at that later. Uh, so Miller was able to speak in every major city in the East Coast, and as a result, Ellen White was able to hear the message, and you know the rest is history. Man, Ellen White heard about it. And um, during this time also, you have the great tent, and the, uh, the, the Millerites were known for the tents that they would pitch, okay? So when these tents would be up in a town, people would know, oh, the Millerites are here, okay? So the tents would be, uh, the, they call it the great tent in the summer of 1842, especially in those years. It was 120 feet in diameter, 50 feet high in the center, and it could seat 3,000 to 4,000 people. That's really big. How, how many people can we house in PIC? 2,000, around 2,000. Well, this tent can house 3,000 to 4,000. And wherever it was pitched, people would, would come. And it's interesting because some, some people in town who are, you know, skeptics would say, ah, you know, let's, let's put a wager on this. And, and I bet the, the, the tent will not be full. But it's always packed. It's always jammed with people. And somehow the messages were really attractive to them. So the tent would be used every 30 days. And the railroads during that time, which was the main, the, one of the main modes of traveling, would have a special schedule just to, so that people can go to these tents. So what were the, what were the hymns that were sung? Okay. The topics that were usually sung were about the Midnight Cry, the Judgment, Second Advent, Reward of the Saints, and other related topics to Christ's Second Coming. And these hymnals were actually, and these are the people, okay, this is an actual picture of the time of the, the camps, the camp meetings during the, these are our forefathers, okay, and foremothers. All right, so... One of the hymnals that Joshua B. Himes compiled is called Songs of Zion. That's the first one that he compiled. But, you know, somehow a few months later, he didn't really like the title. So he changed it to Millennial Musings, a choice selection of hymns designed for the use of Second Advent meetings. This was in 1842. Okay, so it had 121 hymns. In 144 pages, it only had words. No music whatsoever. So only words were in their hymnal. Later on that year, Joshua B. Himes changed his mind a lot. So he compiled another hymnal, which we call, I don't know what's happening, but um, Millennial Harp. Maybe we have just a consistent person. I don't know. Okay. So it was called the Millennial Harp. It's interesting because... Today, we call the generations today the millennials. Um, but anyways, the millennial harp was the third hymnal that Heinz decided to compile. And the, the complete name actually was millennial harp designed for the meeting on the second coming of Christ. So it had two parts. The millennial musings, what, what, which was uh, compiled before, was combined to this particular hymnal. Again, it only had words, and uh, it had 169 hymns, and most of it was on the second coming of Christ. Okay, so this is the next one. Okay, well, before we go there, it's, this is what it looks like inside. So the first one, the Millennial Musings, uh, on the left, on, on your left, you will see a page that has words only. But if you would notice, those who have really good eyes, hymn 77, C, M. Okay? And if you know your hymnal very well, C, M would mean common meter, which means that this particular song, as long as the tune is in common meter or in, you know, can go through uh, 8888, that's, that's the common meter. Eight means eight syllables, okay? So if it falls under that, then you can sing this particular hymn. Okay, so the music part, if you would notice, it's just soprano and the bass. 
Okay, so if you want to sing alto or tenor, then you figure that on your own. Okay, but it's provided. Okay, so somehow um, some notes were provided in not all of the hymns, but some of the hymns. Okay, so what happens then is that it's not uniform. Sometimes the same words would be sung to different tunes. Okay, so who, whatever probably would be the best in that particular. Okay, so the next one that uh, Himes compiled was called Second Advent Hymns Designed to be Used in Prayer and Camp Meeting. So again, no music, just words. All right, so this was mainly used in the great tent meetings. Now, what was the environment like or the aura like when this Millerites were singing? Well, they also have testimonials on how the Adventists were singing. And particularly James White, of course, we're very, very familiar with James White. He tried to describe how it was like, and he said, it is a fact that there was in those days a power in what was called Advent singing, such as was felt in no other. It seemed to me that not a hand or foot moved in all the crowd before me till I had finished all the words of this lengthy melody. Many wept, and the state of feeling was most favorable for the introduction of the grave subject for the evening. The house was crowded three times each day, and a deep impression was made upon the entire community. I don't know if you caught that, but he said that there was a power in what was called Advent singing. What does that mean? Power in what was called Advent singing. When was the last time you, you experienced a song service that was really powerful? It moved you so much that you wept, that you cried. When was that last time? I have never felt it. it I've never experienced that. I wish I could. But in, in, during this time, it was so powerful that they were able, they were weeping by the time they were done with singing. And also, James White was saying that even before, actually even before the words were finished, the, the, of this lengthy melody, many were weeping. And um, what happened is right before, it was this perfect moment, right after the singing, the hearts are open and they were ready to receive the message. And that is one of the roles of the music in our worship service, to open the hearts, okay? So another testimonial, we're very familiar also with Joseph Bates, right? Okay, well, Joseph Bates is one of the oldest, oldest pioneer of the Seventh-day Adventist church, okay? He's a captain, and um, after working for in the sea, then he decided to join the Millerite movement, and he decided to preach as well. And so he said, he was on his way. Remember, I told you a while ago, the railroads would make special schedules to go to this great camp meetings, and great tent camp meetings. And so he was in one of these trains, and something happened to the, to the railroad track. And so they had to wait for a while for it to be fixed. So while they were waiting, he decided, you know what, why don't we sing? So this, they decided to sing. So those who were Millerites in, in the train decided to sing the songs that they were singing in the camp meeting. And this is what he said. Our, com our company commenced singing Adventist hymns, Advent hymns and became so animated and deeply engaged that the people in the city came out in crowds and seemed to listen with breathless attention until the cars came and changed the steam. So, those who were hearing them, those who were hearing the songs for the first time, were actually in awe of what they were singing. They were breathless, okay? And as a result, one of, um, one of the, his name is Elder S. Pauli, okay? One of the preachers for, for the Millerites, he went to a church, and as a result of their singing in the, in the train, 7,000 people came to hear this particular preacher. That's the power of music, of Advent singing. And so later on, Joseph 
Bates said, the clear, weighty, and solemn preaching of the second coming of Christ and the fervent prayers and animated singing of the new of the new second advent hymns accompanied by the spirit of the living god sent such thrills through the camp that many were shouting aloud for joy so it's not just the singing but it also has to come with this holy spirit as well as knowing the message the present truth at their time so as a result while the committee were moving around in a congregation receiving contributions to defray the expenses of the meeting, some of the sisters began to take out their earrings and strip off their finger rings and other jewelry, which example was followed by many others and all thrown into the contribution. The Tonton Camp meeting had taken up in their collection about three flower barrels full of jewelry. How big is a flower barrel? Do you have any idea? How, how big is a barrel of flour? It's big. And they were able to fill three flour bar uh, barrels of jewelry just because the people were so moved by the message and by the, the messages in the song, the songs, and of course the Holy Spirit moving in their hearts. And, and it usually happens. When we, when in the worship service, we become, you know, imbued with, with the Holy Spirit and the messages that we're hearing, the, the natural reaction of ourselves is to give all, to give everything. And this is what happened to this particular listeners. Um, so at this point, I'd like to invite a uh, pianist, did you ask? <laughs> okay. Uh, so that I can... A volunteer, so that I can speak while... while, while um, Mom Cheryl, though, okay. <laughs> Thank you for. Okay, so before we go there to William Miller, okay, so we'll actually we can go there. Okay, um, William Miller, okay, you know. That discovered the 2300 day prophecy that is found in Daniel 814 and we know that William Miller was able to discover this because he was studying his Bible and Bible alone using also of course the concordance and he said if if I would try to understand the Bible that sure so he didn't use any because he said he didn't want to, you know, poison his mind with other um, interpretations. So this is what he did, and he, of course, he came to understand about the year-day principle in Ezekiel, if you're familiar with that. And so by using the year-day principle, he was able to come up that the 2300-day prophecy mentioned in Daniel 8.14 is going to end in March 8.43. He was so sure. Maybe the whole year of 1843, um, Jesus is going to come, or the Lord is going to come. And of course, we know that it, the Lord did not come. That was the first disappointment. And so this guy uh, called Samuel Snow, this guy called Samuel Snow, he was able to discover that, hey, you know what? It's not March of 1843 because we believe that... Um, you know, in the atonement day, he was able to see the connection of the atonement, if you're familiar with atonement, okay, or that point, that, that feast that the Israelites do every once a year, and they would, um, this is like the, the pinnacle of, the, of, of, their, of their year, wherein they, all the sins that they have confessed, okay, are being brought by the high priest, into the most holy place. And that was the practice of the Israelites. And so as the Holy Spirit go into the most holy place, he would, you know, confess all the sins of the people. And so he said that happens at, at the atonement day. And he was able to connect that atonement day would happen in their time on October 22, 1844. Okay? So that is when they said, okay, you know what? Uh, 
Yes, we are. We, we they were disappointed for the first time, but they're going to wait again for another year. And that waiting period became uh, it was called the tarrying time. Okay, for the Adventists. Uh, I hope these are all very familiar to you as Adventists. Okay, because these are, are the foundations of our faith. These are things that you know we we as Adventists should know. Okay. Anyway, so this, this is the tarrying time, and as they were tarrying, a lot of these Adventists were really studying their Bibles. And imagine, these Millerites were 100,000, and then after the first disappointment in 1843, they became 50,000. That's a lot. That's like 50%, okay, of the Millerites. Why? People were discouraged. Why? He's not going to come, you know. And then... October 22 came, and of course, we're commemorating it tomorrow. And during the disappointment, the great disappointment, a lot of people were discouraged. He did not come. And so they were saying, we're studying our Bibles. What's wrong? What's wrong? So they kept studying their Bible, and they realized, okay, that it's not really the date. It's the, the, date the date is correct, but the interpretation is wrong. And so, from that 50,000, you know how many were left after the great disappointment? 50. That's 400, how, how many? Four, four, help me with my math. 400, 50 from 50,000 were left. Okay? And I'm just wanting to go forward. Let us not be like that. Let us not be disappointed with how long we're waiting, you know? We've been waiting. We've been hearing it from our forefathers, from our parents. The Lord is coming soon. He's not yet come. And I hope that we're going to be, be part of that 50, you know, when, when the Lord comes. But, of course, that's just a figurative number. Okay, so one of the songs that really reflected this particular experience of the Millerites, the experience of studying their Bibles and knowing what their Bibles are really talking about is my Bible leads to glory. And we're just going to sing, uh, let's see, just the first stanza. And uh, let's, oh, well, it's a short song. So let's try to sing it. Maybe Imam Cheryl can just play the melody once, and then we can follow on the second run through. <laughs> to glory.
catchy, very easy to, to learn it. So this is one of their songs. And one of the preachers, he was already a known preacher at this time. Mom, I'm going to need you for the rest of the time. <laughs> There's a lot. Of, or unless, you know, you have an appointment, then we can have someone else. Okay. All right. So the next preacher that was really known was this guy called Charles Fitch. And we're, we're going to be talking about him for a while. Okay. So Charles Fitch uh, was a Presbyterian pastor for a prominent church in Boston. And when he heard about William Miller's messages, he was, he was excited to preach it about, you know, the prophecies. But he was ridiculed, he was, he was rejected by his people, he was scorned, he was mocked. And so he's like, you know, some Adventists, when they're being mocked and they, they try to fit in and say, okay, you know what, no one's, gonna, no one's seeing me, so I'm just going to give in. So he was like that for a while, but then his mind was saying to himself, you know what, I should not have done that. So in 1841, he left his church and he decided to preach for the Millerite, uh, Millerite movement. And together with his friend, he, they made this particular chart. Uh, we call it the 1843 chart. And this chart is this particular chart is actually in the general conference. They have this outside because it's a representation of what the pioneers believed in. And if you would notice, this is particularly familiar to us, right? The, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. So the rest is in Daniel, where the bear, you know, the ram, the lion, all of, all of those symbols, they were learning for the first time. The Lord has opened the minds of the people to understand these particular prophecies. And so all of these numbers, they were studying it. And they said, you know, we should present it to the general conference at the time. Um, and so they, they went to the camp meeting presented it to the pioneers, to the other pioneers, and said, you know what, this is a good chart. Let's print 300 copies. And so every preacher at that time would carry these charts. It's like, this is like their PowerPoint presentation. They just hang the charts there, and you know, people will learn the prophecies quicker. So as a result of this particular message, uh, Charles Fitch was able to discover that the second angel's message was already being preached during their time. You know, today we say, you know, we, we should preach the three angels' messages, and that's correct. But it has already happened. The first and the second angels' messages were already preached during the time of the pioneers. And we are under the third angel's message. So we're really very close to the second coming of Christ. And so he said... In the second angel's message, message, let me test you. What is the first message all about? The first angel's message. Hmm? What does it say? First angel's message. Where do we see, where do we find the three angel's messages in the Bible? Revelation 14 verses. Verses what? Six through twelve. Very good. Okay. So first angel's message. What is that? If you have your Bible. Huh? Can you read the first message? Can someone read the second angel? Someone? I, I heard someone from here. Okay, you can read it. The second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink to the maddening wine of her adultery. Okay, so message, the second angel's message is actually saying, you know, come out of her, my people. And come out of her, why? Because Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And so, 
Charles Fitch was studying his Bible and he said he found out that the churches that they were a part of at the time, the Protestant churches, because they have rejected the messages of Christ's second coming, they are now considered Babylon. They have to come out of Babylon. Okay? So he was preaching that kind of message and of course the churches rejected him and rejected this particular message. But we know that what he was preaching about is actually true. Okay, so this particular experience, and not just Charles Fitch experienced it, but the, the, the sense of being ridiculed, rejected, scorned, and mocked. Of course, Jesus Christ experienced all of those things, and the Millerites also experienced it. They, had, they were disfellowshipped from, from their churches. And so he, uh, he actually composed this particular song. Well, not the music, but the words, and it's entitled One Precious Boon, O Lord I Seek. Okay, so we're just going to sing the second and third stanza, and it's actually here. Like, So right. once again, she's going to play once, and we're going to sing just the second and the third. And if you would note, oh. yeah. so you notice, earth scoff and scorn will please I'll bear, nor mourn though underfoot I'm trod. If day by day I may but share thine approbation, oh my God. The friends I love may turn from me, the words unkind may pierce me through, but this my daily prayer shall be forgive. They know not what they do. in the Bible said the same words? Jesus, right? And that was the very experience of the Millerites. They were being scorned and it was reflected in their song. Thank you. And uh, how much were they scorned? Well, a lot of cartoons like this would be in the newspapers. What was it all about? Grand Ascension of the Miller tab Tabernacle. They were mocking the second coming of Christ and that they said uh, when, when he comes, he will bring all the, you know, your big tent in, in the clouds and but then you know this guy that fell that was taken by the devil is Joshua V. Himes and I don't know why why they would do such a thing but of course not you know the present truth is not always palatable to a lot of people. So that was one of the things that they would that they would do. Alienation and rejection. Many were um disfellowship from the church and in fact, a lot of these uh, non-believers would go to their houses and they would sing outside, you know, they would sing this song, so, you know, the, the early Advent hymns, they would sing it as a mockery, okay? And especially when the Millerites accepted the Sabbath truth, because when they accepted it, they stuck out like a sore thumb. What happened? 
Of course, on Saturday, they will stay in their houses and on Sunday, they will work on their farms. That's like one of the main jobs that the Millerites were doing. And of course, while they're working on their farms, the other neighbors are going, they're on their way to the church. And so it's so obvious, okay, who were the Millerites. And so as a result, they made fun of these people. And they would, like I said, they will make spoofs and, and cartoons. Of, of the Millerite movement. Okay, so there's this one, uh, in one of the camp meetings that they were holding, there was this experience that Hiram Edson related. Anyone familiar with Hiram Edson? These are names, yes, that we, you know, he's a pioneer, a major pillar in the church. And Hiram Edson was one of those people that during October 22, 1844, when he did not come, he was so discouraged, he went to the cornfields and he cried to God. You know, what was wrong with, with what we believed in? And as a, while he was in this state of anxiety, of distress, he saw, he said that he saw a vision of the Lord going from the holy place into the most holy place. And that is when he understood, wait, maybe we should study the sand you know what is the sanctuary all about because they believe that the sanctuary is in earth and they realize that the sanctuary is in heaven that is where jesus is going to come in the sanctuary in heaven and so that's hiram edson and so before that particular experience hiram edson was a teenager and you should understand a lot of our pioneers were, were teenagers okay very young 20 21 22 joseph bates was the oldest and he was around 50. So Hiram Edson, he was with his friends and they were passing out literature. They were right outside the camp meeting and they noticed a wagon full of people, like 15 people come out of the wagon. And they were very rowdy, very noisy, very, you know, like they were laughing and stuff. And so they already knew that these people came to the camp meeting to make fun or to ridicule the messages. And so, you know, being a good Millerite, they would, you know, they still passed out literature to them and gave them seats. Now, when they went into the camp meeting, the tent, this particular song that we're going to sing next was being sung. Here is no rest. Here is no rest. And they were singing, and he said that while these people coming into the, the, the tent, they were hearing it and they were convicted right away just by hearing strains of, of the song. And it's interesting, they wanted to go out of the camp meeting. They, were, they wanted to resist the conviction and the conversion that they were feeling. It's page 20. And they were, they were somehow, you know, like when you're in a place, you want to go, but you can't leave. It was that kind of feeling that they had. And so this, third, this group of people wanted to leave, but they stayed, and they were right by the door. And only two people left, like actually walked out, and it's a husband and wife with their little baby, one-year-old baby. So the, 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 the other people, they stayed. They kept staying. And the husband and wife said, you know, come on, let's go, let's go. These this people are up to no good, you know. But it seemed like they were pasted. They were just mesmerized, compelled by the message of the song. Again, we're hearing, we're actually seeing what kind of songs, what was the power like um, in Advent singing. And this is one of the results. Those people were so convicted just by hearing the messages in the songs. And so the husband and the wife, they said, you know what, we're going to leave you. So they walked five to six miles. Can you imagine, you know, you're carrying a one-year-old baby and you're going to walk five to six miles just because you don't want to hear the gospel truth, you know? So they walked. But you know what? The next day, what happened to this husband and wife? They got so convicted and they came back together with the other company that they left and they were all converted. What was this song that they heard? Here is no rest. But actually, um, Hiram Edson said, the child was not their heaviest burden. Their conviction was too deep to be easily shaken off. They were back again at the next evening meeting and found pardon and peace in believing. Praise God. Okay, so that's Hiram Edson. Here is no rest. This is a familiar 
tune because if you know long, long ago, -da 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 that's one of the very famous tunes during that day. So, okay, first stanza only. One might ask, how, did, how are they convicted with that very simple tune and very simple lyrics? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And I guess their hearts were also open somehow. Okay, the hearts were uh, all um, open to hear. Okay, the next song is We're Traveling Home. And there's a really interesting story about this. A lot of this particular song is talking about inviting the person, okay? Come on, believe what I'm believing because you have nothing to lose. What do you have to lose, you know? But anyways, of course, we know Mil William Miller is the main person that really preached a lot about this particular truths of, the, of his time, the present truths of his time. And so as a result, a lot of people are actually turned off, those who didn't want to believe. And this particular doctor, um, history doesn't tell what his name was, but this doctor, he said he was, that he lives close to where William Miller lives, and he said, you know what, William Miller is a monomaniac. Monomaniac means that if you talk about this particular subject, and this happens to be the subject that he is raving about, then he, he's going to go crazy, you know? So, for example, if you talk to William Miller about the prophecies, he's going to go crazy in front of you, like a lunatic. So, he's a monomania. On other things, he's okay. But don't ever talk about the prophecies with William Miller, okay? Because he's going to go crazy. So, that is the, the kind of rumor that we're spread, they're spreading around because of this doctor. And, of course, as a doctor, people will believe him. So Miller heard about it, and he said, okay, let's, let's see. I, I want to do something about it. So his child got sick, and he called for this particular doctor. And, you know, the doctor, you know, attended to the child and said, okay, this is what you need to do, blah, blah, blah. And as he was about to leave, he noticed William Miller sitting on the corner, and he was very sad. And the doctor said, what's wrong with you? Are, are you also sick? Miller said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also sick, and I, I think you need to examine me as well, because I heard that I have this sickness called mono, monomaniac, uh, that I, people are saying that I'm a monomaniac, and I want you to, to get well. So the doctor blushed, because he knew that the uh, rumors were from him. But, you know, he kept his cool, and Miller said, okay, well, um, I'm going to pay the examination fee, just you know, like how you would examine other people, but I want to get well from this sickness. And the doctor said, oh, okay, well, of course, the only way that you can diagnose if he's really a monomaniac is to listen to him talk about the topic that he will get crazy about. So for an hour and a half, the doctor listened to a Bible study on the prophecies and he sat there patiently and you know how, how what's gonna happen and he explained to him you know with the numbers that 843 the Lord is going to come you know the doctor was just amazed and so even but right before Miller finished he ran off his bag didn't even wait for the payment and he ran. It was red and he ran. The next day, he came back to William Miller's house and he said, 
I did not sleep last night. I didn't have any sleep last night whatsoever because of the things that you told me. And Miller said, why? What, what, what's wrong? What happened? And he said, well, from what you said, I realized that if he's going to come very soon, I'm not ready. And he, the doctor said, if, if I'm not ready, I want to be ready. And can you give me more Bible studies? And you know what happened to the doctor? He became a maniac himself. And he was preaching about the truth. And that's, that's a very interesting way of how Miller invited people to believe this message. He was not just this one person who would preach. Actually, Ellen White was saying that Miller, or Father Miller, was called Father Miller because whenever he preached, and he would see someone come in, and an old person, he would go, he would leave the podium, go and assist that person, because he can see where the vacant seats are, assist that person, and then went right back to preaching. He was very fatherly, and very nice, very kind man. So, uh, he was inviting people, and these are one of the songs that they would sing. We're Trapped Home, page number 15, um, page 66. highlight this particular stanzas because one of the things that really stood out in the Millerites uh, music is the graphic way that they describe the prophecies. For example, the, the stanza five, well stanza six, oh could I hear, I, I hear some sinner say, I will go, I will go, I'll start this moment, clear the way, let me go, let me go. My old companions, fare you well, I will not go with you to hell. I mean with Jesus Christ to dwell, let me go, fare you well. You don't see this kind of songs now. You know, like very strong conviction about what they believe. And so if you don't believe, then you go to hell. I won't, you know. Today, we just use that particular saying when we're really mad at someone. You hey, go to hell, you know. But we don't really mean it in such a way. But anyways, this is how it sounds like. So that is one of their sayings. And it's so real to them. You know, today when we see someone, Uy, kamusta ka? How are you? Kamusta yung ganto? Ganyan. You know, we talk about each other, you know, like maybe boyfriend or what did we eat? No, those are common sayings. For them, whenever they see a friend, their common saying is, do you still believe that Jesus is coming soon? Well, kamusta ka? Okay. That's how, how much it flows over to their regular life. Okay. 
And all of the people that really believe the truth is going to come as Charles Fitch. We heard about him a while ago. Charles Fitch really, truly believed that Jesus is going to come. Anyways, one day, he was coming from a preaching appointment, and he was walking. You know, normally people travel by horse, by train, by boat, or by walking. So he was walking home, and he met a group of people, and they said, Pastor Fitch, we believe that Jesus is coming soon. Can you baptize us right now? And the, at that time, it was around, you know, um, winter, close to winter. So can you imagine, in the northern part of the States, when it's close to winter, it's really cold, very, very cold. he was invited to a speaking engagement he was on his horse again it's still very cold and somehow a virus got to him and he was never able to recover and he died October 14 1844 and the funeral was the happiest funeral you will ever see the children were smiling the wife is smiling and they said you know what Daddy, Daddy, we're going to see Daddy in a few more days. We're going to see him. Don't worry. It's October 22. When the Lord comes, he's going to, you know, have those people that are faithful to the earth all be resurrected. You know, they really believed it. But of course, you know what happened in October 22, in 44. But that's how much they believed it. And this is one of the very popular songs that they would sing. You will see our Lord the coming. So we don't have a pianist no more. So who's next? All right. Uh, you will see your Lord the coming at page 71.
actually this song is also very famous because James White would use it a lot whenever he preached, okay? So James White, he's much younger here, okay? You know how old he left the house? When, when he first heard Miller's messages, he said to his father, Dad, give me a horse and give me some money because I'm going to go and preach this message. He was 21 years old at that time. Who is 21 years old here? 21, maybe younger. <laughs> okay, 21, okay. So he would also raise your hands. Can you imagine yourself at 21 years old just leaving the house and just going and, you know, preaching God's message? Okay. But of course, at that time, 21 years old is kind of really mature. I guess as the generations go by, you know, the maturity level goes, you know, <laughs> lower. Anyways, but at 21 years old, James White, James White was so convicted that he said, I'm going to go on a preaching itinerary and I'm going to preach this message. And so on his horse for four months, just with the clothes on his back, the charts that you saw a while ago, he went from church to church to preach the gospel, the present truth. And as he went, he noticed that in a lot of these churches that he would visit, there's always a lot of people, and they're very noisy at times. And so one way that he made the service orderly is he would start from the back, he had a, his Bible in his hand, and he will start singing. Now, James White is a musician, if you didn't know that, music majors, okay? James White um, has a background in music, and he was trained in the singing schools during that time. Uh, singing schools, of course, if you don't know it, singing schools were, you know, where in this teacher would go from town to town, and those who are interested in learning music, then they can go to him and learn how to sing. So James White was a, was a product of those singing schools, and he, would, and he was able to develop his knowledge in music. And at the same time, he has a very good voice, okay? So he would use that to his advantage, his singing voice and his knowledge of the gospel message. And so he would beat the steady beat on his Bible while he's singing, you will see your Lord coming. So that will really grab the attention of the people and they will start singing with him because it's a very, very familiar hymn. So in that way, he was able to organize them. And he even said, Litchfield Plains was my next place of labor. The house was crowded the first evening. In fact, it was with difficulty that I found my way to the pulpit. To call the people to order, the first words they heard me, from me were in singing, you will see your Lord a coming. So um, he said... Also, the reader certainly cannot see poetic merit in the repetition of these simple lines. Now, as a musician, if you, dis if you try to analyze music and you see something is repeated over and over again, why do you think the composer repeated a certain phrase or a certain line? Is it because he's bored? Then why? Emphasize? What else? Okay, to emphasize that particular message. And so he, that's why even, even James White here was, has analyzed the music. Maybe those who's reading this particular hymn will say, you know what, it's just a repetition. How come it's always repeated? But then when they sang it, the repetition actually um, gave it a more powerful, um, stirring way of, of singing. So the certain, the reader certainly cannot see poetic merit in the repetition of the simple lines. And if he has never heard a sweet melody to which they were attached, he will be at a loss to see how one voice could employ them so as to hold nearly a thousand persons in almost breathless silence. A thousand people, that's a lot. And James White was able to um, lead out in this. Okay, so I went ahead of myself. This is actually the lake where uh, Charles Fitch was um, baptizing the groups of people, Lake Erie. Okay, it can get really, really cold during the winter time. Okay, so James White 
was a very musical person, and so he understood the role of the music in, in their times. Okay, Very, very important that while we're learning all these new lights, all these new messages, we should sing about it, Okay, just like Martin Luther. And so he compiled a lot of hymnals, starting from 1849, just, just um, five years from the Great Disappointment, he compiled the first SDA, well, not yet the seventh day, but the Adventist hymnal, and it has a very long name. Hymns for God's peculiar people that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I think you cannot say that in one, sin, in one breath. All right? So it, was, it had 53 hymns, 48 pages. Very, very, very simple uh, hymnals, very small as well. Okay? Uh, it's interesting also that in the title you will see that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Where, in what Bible text do you see this particular line, if you know your Bibles very well? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You know what? Adventists were used, um, people were used to knowing Adventists as people that really know their Bibles very well. Okay? And um, they would use it a lot, you know, in, in a lot of their sayings and stuff. In fact, when they say a sentence, some, some verses are inserted there. Okay? And so even in the titles of their hymns, it has like an insertion of particular text. And this is found in Revelation 19, verse 10. That keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So another hymn after that, a year late, um, 1852, he made compiled the second hymnal. Hymns for Second Advent believers who observe the Sabbath of the Lord. So by this time, the Seventh Day Adventist, ch the, the church or the the Millerites, learned the Sabbath truth and they decided to keep it. And so the hymnals also reflected what they were learning. It had 139 hymns and 112 pages. And then, of course, in the following years, he kept compiling. James White was a busy person. He kept compiling hymnals, and he really saw the importance of the hymns um, in this movement. Okay, I, I, I keep saying movement because it was a movement. It is still a movement. Okay, so these are the hymns, 1853, and then in 1855, it's in yellow because that is when the hymnals started to include music. Okay, so all this time before 1855, hymnals that uh, James White compiled did not include any notes in it. And so can you imagine the Millerites at that time, they, they lived very, very far from each other. Okay, so you have to travel for hours to go to your next neighbor. Okay, so... A lot of their songs actually talked about being lonely because they feel like they're alone, you know, they, there's no one else that believes the same thing. And that's why even in Review and Herald, uh, James White or Ellen White would talk to the people and say the scattered flock because they're all over the place, okay? So there's very few of them. And so can you imagine, they only have camp meetings every two, uh, twice a year. And so a song is being introduced in the camp meeting. You're so excited. Wow, there's a new song that I can sing. And you go home, you forgot the melody. And then, you, you, then they, they would advertise in the Review and Herald, there's a new hymnal. And then you go and you read and there's no music. And then you forgot the melody. How am I going to sing this? And then maybe when you have worship with another person, I think it sounded like this. Can you imagine when they gather together again in the camp meeting, People know other tunes, and so it was a disaster, you know, when they would sing together because the people have forgotten. So they really made sure that in the third hymnal, the compilation, they would have the notes as well. And so somehow they would see the direction of the notes and would know, you know. So they had singing schools, and so they had a way to learn the, learn the songs. Of course, one of the things that they used was the secular tunes of the day. The secular tunes are, of course, very famous, but at that time, it's not very far away from how we have today. Secular and sacred songs, so different, so diverse. At that time, it was so close, okay? So you can actually put the hymns, words, and use the secular tunes. 
Um, so these are all the hymns, and from 1855, the rest of the hymnals included music in it. And this is how it looked like inside. So started from the, from the top, for example, Land of Rest. Again, you see CM, or the metrical index of the song. Common meter. And then there are other hymns on the page, 806, 807, which means that you can also sing those hymns to the same tune. Okay, so it's much more organized, okay? James White really worked hard on it. Okay, so aside from, aside from the experiences of the Millerites um, reflecting the, the experiences that they had, doctrines was also emphasized in their um, hymns, okay? I'm sure you are all familiar with this next one because this is in our hymnal, as the age 598. Anyone who knows this song, watch you saints, or you are a young generation, or you don't know. <laughs> okay. And I'm really glad it's still in our SDA hymnal, but it's very pregnant with doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. First stanza. Watch you saints with eyelids waking, lo, the powers of heaven are shaking. Keep your lamps all trimmed and burning, ready for your Lord's returning. And of course, the refrain. In that first stanza, did you catch anything that is related to the Bible? So let's analyze the words now. Huh? please wherever you are don't be shy come on you notice anything from the first stanza that is somehow has the flavor of some Bible text first line second line third line fourth line Third line. What is in the third line? Keep your last virgins, right? The ten virgins. Ready for your Lord's believe that they symbolize the ten virgins. Because that really happened. Even if you would go to Ellen White's writings, he did say she did say that the Millerites who were waiting for Christ to come in 1843 were the ten virgins. But, like I told you a while ago, 100,000 of them and then 50,000 was left behind. Okay, Five virgins did not have the oil. And as a result, you know, they, they woke up and they were not ready for the Lord to come. 50 were left behind. So that was somehow, it, it somehow prefigured um, the, the ten virgins. Second stanza, lo the promise of your Savior, pardon sin and purchase favor, blood wash robes and crowns of glory, haste to tell redemption story. Of course the, the, sal uh, the salvation, the plan of salvation is there, okay, and they were understanding the, the role of Christ, okay, as a savior who will forgive their sins. Three, kingdoms at their base are crumbling. Okay, you see that in the image, okay? The kingdoms that are crumbling, they're, they're falling into pieces and because of the stone that hit the, the toe of, of the image, okay? Hark his chariot wheels are rumbling, chariot wheels. Who was the prophet that saw this chariot wheels? Okay, and also Ezekiel. Tell, tell, of grace abounding while the seventh trump is sounding. How many trumpets are mentioned in Revelation? How many? Seven. There's seven trumpets. And all of these trumpets actually signify something in the Bible. And so they're saying that at their time, the seventh trumpet is already sounding. If, if the seventh trumpet is the last trumpet, during their time, how much closer are we to Christ coming, right? Um, 
For nations wane, though proud and stately, Christ's kingdom hasteth greatly. Earth your latest pangs is summing, shout ye saints, your Lord is coming. Then, of course, the five sinners come with Christ while Christ is pleading. Now for you, he is interceding. That is, he being in the most holy place. His air grace and time diminish shall proclaim the mystery is finished. So all stanzas is just pregnant with doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And of course, only an Adventist can write a hymn such as this. And her name is Phoebe Palmer, and she wrote it actually in 1844, okay? And I would think that she wrote this after a great disappointment. I'm guessing, but it's, it's a, a I, I have a pretty good feeling that it was after because they were talking about the sanctuary message at this point. So Phoebe Palmer is one of the Bible study contacts of Charles Fitch. So he was studying with her and her husband together with Apollos Hill. Okay. And this is what she came up with. The next song. Of course, it's very obvious. The three messages. Lo, an angel loud proclaiming brings the gospel of good news to every kindred tongue and people. Fear the Lord and give glory to proclamation, proclamation of the hour judgment here. A while ago when I asked, what are the three angels' messages? It's kind of like a hesitation, okay? But I'm sure these people during their time, when you ask them, they know. They really know what it is. And it's even in their songs. So maybe let's try, let's try to sing this one. Uh, uh, proclaim. If you guys need to, like, you know, go out, drink, it's fine. I, I'm not offended by it. So just, just try to be discreet as much as possible. So let's sing the next one. Three angels' messages. This is a very familiar, familiar tune, okay, for, for many.
are lines that a Sunday church cannot sing, okay? Only Seventh-day Adventist church, and that's how distinct our message is. The last one for this particular section is prayer of the tree. And just, I'm just going to show you the stanzas. We're not going to sing it for interest of time. And this particular hymn got a lot of titles. So first, it was hymn for 1843. And then later on, it got the title, The Conflagration. What is conflagration? When you're being conflagorized, what does that mean? Okay, conflagration is burning, okay? This is like the final end of a person. Later on, they ch change the words because it's so graphic and so scary that, you know, they change it prayer for the church and then some, were, some of these particular stances I'm going to show you are words that are removed from the hymnal that uh, the general conference published. Okay, why is it so scary? Well, third stanza says, if earth and all her treasure are doomed to fire and flame, her royal pomp and pleasure are but an empty name. Her kings, her crowns, her glory, her armies, fleets, and pride may bubble forth her story while floating down the tide. If you're someone who likes words, poems, and stuff like that, you can really see the image of this you know, the world falling and crumbling into pieces and being swallowed by water and bubbling and stuff like that. So it's being shown in third stanza. And then when it falls into the water, ocean, the ocean or the ocean to which her grandeur stand now foams in dreadful motion, her bows and pomp to end. See, see the flames ascending, the seas themselves explode, the clouds, the sky is rending with cries of God, oh God. You know, it's like, this is apocalypse right there happening. And they cannot just sing it, you know, with, without getting scared. And five, oh, hear the sad petition. Rocks crush us into dust. Who in the last days, if last day events, who's going to say this? Rocks fall on us. The unrighteous, okay? Rocks crush us un, un, into the dust. Oh, pity our condition, or damned we surely must. We thought that we were wiser than pastors, saints, and all, yet sinners, skeptic, meister, must not suffer loss for all. Ye mortals take the warning, ten thousand calls in fight. Should you neglect the morning, then comes the doleful night. Now mercies had extended, the vilest wretch could save, but oh, if this be ended, you're lost beyond the grave. Okay, so again they're saying, here is a, an example that, of a hymn that, has not made it to our Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, him not, because for some reasons it's really, really graphic, okay? A lot of research has been done while some of the songs did not make it, and aside from the doctrines, it's also because of, of its message that is um, somehow um, scaring people. And so a lot of the hymns are watered down. And this particular hymn went through a lot of watering down. And if you would, if you would see the actual the prayer for the church, it's very nice, okay? Very nice to the ears for, for, for many people. So anyway, so that is one of the songs that uh, they were saying. And it's actually sung to the tune of Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Okay? So I'm sure you're familiar with that particular song. Okay, I'm almost done here. So it's either we have a break or we keep going. We keep going. All right. So, aside from the second coming of Christ, which is one, this, this is why the Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist Church is formed, is because they believe that Jesus Christ is going to come soon. Tomorrow, it's going to be 172 years. And that's really sad because we don't plan to have commemoration of October 22, 1844. Oh, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist long, long, long time ago, you know, we're, we're 172 years old. No, we want Jesus Christ to come soon. And so, uh, after the fact that Jesus did not come October 22, 1844, as it said a while ago, 
they began to study their Bibles more and they understood the sanctuary message. Sanctuary, the sanctuary message is one of the doctrines that we hold so dear. No other uh, church can explain the sanctuary message as well as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, okay? And of course we know that the sanctuary is wherein we understood it as Christ, um, Christ's death on the cross and his priesthood in heaven is symbolized by what Moses did in the Old Testament. You know, when they had the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary, and we would have to memorize it in our elementary days. I don't know if you remember that. You know, you have to draw that rectangle and then you have, what, 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 what do you see first when you go inside the sanctuary? You have to wash your hands, the labor, and then they have the altar of sacrifice. And then you have the holy place, wherein you have the candlesticks, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. And then when you go into the most holy place, you see the Ark of Covenant. And so they began to understand that these are symbolizing what actually happened in 1844. And so when they began to understand these messages, they started publishing, okay, this is why the Lord did not come. It's because he came to the heavenly sanctuary, most holy place, and not the earth as a sanctuary. And publication after publication ensued. And in fact, Ellen White, she emphasized the importance of knowing the sanctuary message. And she said, in Great Controversy, page 488, the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves. You cannot depend on someone to know it for you. Okay? She says you need to know it for yourself. Understand it for yourself. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and the work of their great high priest. Otherwise, what happens if we don't know it for ourselves? Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith, which is essential at this time, or to occupy the position which God designs to fill. It is the foundation of our faith, and in fact, she actually says it. The correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. It is the foundation. Yes, we believe Jesus Christ is coming soon, but at the same time, more importantly, we know that he is in heaven interceding for our sins. And what happens when he's done interceding? Is he going to stay interceding for us? No, right? What happens? The priest has to get out of the most holy place at some point, and then you have the blotting away of sins. Sins are forever blotted out. How are they gonna, how is our sin gonna be blotted out? According to the practice of the Israelites, they would put the hands of the priest would, you know, he would put it on top of a goat's head, and then he will lead the goat into the wilderness and let it run. We know as Adventists, prophetically speaking, the goat represents Satan. And so it's gonna be placed on him. And so Satan is going to spend a thousand years, okay, that's a millennium, and he is going to pay for the sins that the people of God has committed. Okay, so those are things, those are very important messages. And so if we know that he is in the most holy place, we don't just live our lives as if, you know what, God is going to be there interceding for me for the rest of my life. I don't have to worry. No, he's going to come out as so, um, soon and very soon. We don't know what that is, but we always have to be ready. And so this kind of message, very solemn. So from the excitement, God is going to come soon. And then they realize, you know what? We're not ready. We're not ready for him to come. And the, the messages of the hymns also reflected that particular thought. And so in, in um, SDA hymnal 417, you have the iPad. Okay, it's not there. Okay, there's this particular hymn that I have never heard any church sing. So, music majors, when you visit churches, please teach this song. Learn it for yourselves and teach it. This is like 
we rarely hear songs about the sanctuary in our churches. You know, we always hear about, you know, Jesus Christ coming soon, the Sabbath, uh, you know, uh, about God's love for me, nature. But rarely do we sing about the sanctuary. You know, the only time we sing the sanctuary song is when after the prayer, the wonders of redeeming love. I think we sang that before in, in PIC as a response, but that's the only thing. For So it's in three, two.
stuff get messed up. Anyways, um, it's really, it's really, really captures what we believe about the sanctuary, especially the part here um, at the second stanza. He who came down to die, an offering for the sins of men, and then ascended up on high, and will return again. Now he's standing before the ark and mercy seat and cherubim to plead his blood for saints and make the last remember of their sin. So I really hope our, our churches will learn this particular hymn. No one has sang this ever. If, even in the States, I never hear anyone sing. It's so sad. Roswell Cottrell is a pioneer of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He was actually a Seventh-day Baptist. And he refused to join the Millerite movement because they did not believe the Sabbath. And so when they learned of the Sabbath truth, Roswell said, I'm ready to become an Adventist now because they now believe the Sabbath. And of course, we're familiar with the story of how we have accepted the Sabbath, the Sabbath day as the Sabbath. Of course, you know about Rachel Oaks, Frederick Wheeler. These are names that should be familiar. But anyways, um, one of the, of course, Seventh-day Adventist Church will never be Seventh-day Adventist Church. I don't know what's wrong. But Seventh-day Adventist Church will never be Seventh-day Adventist Church without the Sabbath truth, okay? And, of course, we have a lot of Sabbath songs that we know. Again, this particular hymn that we're going to uh, look at is something that's never sung, and it never made its way into... The hymnal, okay? But it is very distinct. It's called the seal. And that particular terminology itself is already very distinct. We know that at the end, uh, there's two kinds of seals, right? We are familiar about the mark of the beast and the seal of God, okay? And we know that it's not a literal mark on the forehead or on the hand, but we know that what is the seal? The Sabbath, right? It's his seal. And so we are called to keep his seal. The seal. Behold, the light appears, the holy Sabbath day, and magnified so clear that none may need to stray. Though small at first, a sun gives ray, his strength ascends to perfect day. That particular stanza talks about, you know, it, they never really understood it at first, but then later on, the more they understood it, and they, they started practicing it. Second stanza, it is the message clear ascending from the east. God's servants now appear. Who will not worship beasts? For angels hold the winds revealed until God's servants all are sealed. Okay, so I really like that. I really like that second stanza because again, it's pregnant with with our doctrine. We know Sunday law. We always hear about the Sunday law, but as Adventists, you know, we're just scared of it. Okay, oh, you know, Sunday law. This is gonna happen. Oh, you know, this and that. But uh, we know that right now, so to speak, the four winds are being held. Okay, and that is why we still have the time to evangelize and to share the message. And there will come a time when God will not hold the four winds anymore because his servants are sealed. He has found the 144,000 that is faithful to him. And then, of course, you know, the, the author, whoever is the author is actually anonymous. We don't know who this person is, but clearly he is an Adventist. He talked about you know, what they res what happened to the Israelites in, in, uh, in Egypt. And then he also compared that, that Sabbath is a sign, okay, that we should all understand. So it has a very beautiful melody, and the title is, it's not in the Seventh-day Adventist hymn, no, but there's no tune, like I said, there's no tune, so I had the liberty of choosing the, the tunes, but so my song is found in the hymnal to be the tune.
the tune will be 188 in the NSDA hymnal, okay? But these are going to be the words. So we're just gonna sing the second and the fourth stanza. that she decided to leave the, the church. And she said, you know what, I don't have, I don't have anything to do with the Millerites anymore because it's not true what they're saying. So what she decided to do is when she went to, you know, she went to college and enrolled in a school that taught arts and literature. And so her mom was so concerned about Annie Smith. She's, she was thinking, you know, I'm really concerned about my daughter. So she heard that Joseph Bates was going to preach at a location close to where Annie Smith was living. And so she 